Hi, my name is Doug Travis. Some of you will recognize me as Drew's brother. I hope you won't hold him accountable for anything I say during these minutes. I'm very, very proud of him, and I'm proud uh, and very gratified by the very good work First Presbyterian Church is doing in this time of great stress during the pandemic. Let us pray. Oh God, your love is embodied in Jesus Christ, who washed disciples' feet on the night of his betrayal. Wash us from the stain of sin, so that in hours of danger we may not fail but follow your Son through every trial, and praise him always as Lord and Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our reading for today, Monday, Thursday, is John 13, verses 1 through 17 and 31 through 35. It goes like this. Now, before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel about himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus answered, you do not understand now what I am doing, but later you will understand. And Peter said to him, you will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus said to him, one who is bathed does not need to wash except for the feet, but is entirely clean. And you are clean, though not all of you. For he knew who was to betray him. For this reason, he said, not all of you are clean. After he had washed their feet, had put on his robe, and had returned to the table, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. Very truly I tell you, servants are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. Jesus said, now the Son of Man has been glorified. And God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you can not come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. This is an extraordinary text. There are many, many things I want to touch upon in it, but I need to limit myself to make a simple point. Notice in verse 1, John tells us that Jesus, having loved his own who were in the world, loved them to the end. 
The word end there is very significant. It actually means to love them till the goal is achieved, till the task is accomplished. In other words, he's about to fulfill his entire ministry on earth. And then notice this in verse 3. Jesus had come from God and was returning to God. This reminds me of another passage in the New Testament, which I think makes a very similar point. It's from the second chapter of Paul's letter to the Philippians, where Paul writes, Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. What these two passages raised for us is the question, who was Jesus really? And the point that both John and Paul are making is that Jesus, though a human being, was also more than a human being. The Word of God, the second person of the Trinity, the Son of God, who came into flesh for us to demonstrate to us God's love. And then notice what Paul wrote. He took the form of a slave. Now, this is terribly important. Between a third and one half of all the people in the Roman Empire were slaves. The Roman economy depended upon that many people being slaves. And in fact, the Roman economy would have fallen apart had they not held slaves, much like the economy of the American South completely fell apart when slavery was abolished. Paul tells us that the son took the form of a slave and then Jesus, on the night before he is betrayed, also does the work of a slave. For make no mistake about it, in the first century world, washing somebody's feet was a job of a slave. And what Jesus is doing is he's demonstrating to them his willingness to serve, not simply as a servant, but as a slave, somebody with the least stature possible to get across to the disciples just how much love God is showing them and is showing the world for the very creator of the universe has become one with us to demonstrate that he exercises no more stature than that of the lowliest human being in order to express his love. That's what's going on. And it is utterly shocking to the disciples. That's why Peter says, you're going to wash my feet and tries to resist it. And then notice what happens in verses 12 through 15. Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your teacher and Lord, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. And then here's the verse that matters the most. For I have set you an example that you should do as I have done to you. One of my favorite sayings of all is, example's not the best teacher, it's the only teacher. Anybody who's raised children knows that very, very well. Kids will always follow your example before they'll do what you tell them to do. And then he says something very, very interesting, Jesus does, he says, I give you a new commandment that you should love one another just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. Now let's be clear about something. In Leviticus 19, 18, we read, you shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against any of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The commandment to love our neighbor as ourself predates Jesus by centuries. Every good Jew knew the commandment. But this is a new commandment. And what makes this a new commandment is that Jesus wants us to love as he has loved us. Jesus wants us 
to follow his example. Now, this may sound like Jesus is making heroic demands of us. How can I possibly love the way Jesus loves? And the answer is, well, you can't, and I can't either, unless we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, which Jesus promises us, which enables God to love through us. And how do we do that? Well, we have to have our eyes and our ears open to see and hear what God is calling us to do, who God is calling us to love, and then learn to be quick to obey the command the moment presents. Let me share a very brief story with you. When our older daughter, Sasha, was about five, we were living in New York City, and I had just picked her up from the school bus on one cold winter day, and as she got off the bus, we saw a man lying atop the grate above the subway. It was very cold, it was snowing. He had on pants and a shirt and shoes, but no socks, no coat, no gloves, no hat. He was, and he was shivering terribly and he was, he was asleep. He was unconscious, but it was obvious that he was suffering. Now, to be completely honest with you, had I not had my daughter with him, I probably would have thought, well, this is really unfortunate. But the simple truth of the matter is New York has lots of homeless people and what can I possibly do for this guy? But I couldn't bear the thought that my daughter would see me ignore a need so obvious. And so I decided to do something. I had a London fog coat and I went to where the man was. I woke him up and I got him to stand up and I took my coat off and I gave it to him. And as I did this, something extraordinary happened people began to gather around. And before I knew it, somebody had gone to their apartment to get socks, somebody had gone to their apartment to get a scarf, somebody had gone to their apartment to get hat, somebody had gone to their apartment to get gloves. And there was one man who was just convinced we were all wasting our effort. But he finally said, as I was getting in the cab with the man, the man to take him to someplace safe where he could get supper and a good night's sleep, he finally said, you've done a good thing. Now, nothing heroic about this. My five-year-old daughter was there watching me. I had to do something in order to demonstrate to her how I thought human beings should love one another. And I did what the moment called for. In other words, we don't have to go find some grand and heroic gesture to make to demonstrate that we're loving as Jesus loves. We just have to have our eyes open and our ears open to discern what Jesus wants us to do in a given minute. And when we do that, he, through the power of the Holy Spirit, will give us the power to love as he loves. And we love primarily through the small gestures, not the great gestures. So in conclusion, let me say this. Jesus did not give us the command to love one another as he loves us to make us, make us anxious that we can't make the grade. Rather, he gave us that command so that we can grow in confidence that if we try to love as he calls us to, if we try to love as he first loved us in his power and the po power of the Holy Spirit, we can do so. And the more we do so, the more we find we are able to do. In this time of pandemic, when we're all forced to stay at home to preserve as much life as we can, let us find the courage to ask, Lord, what little things would you have us do today? Whose feet would you have us wash today? If we truly and freely ask that question, I'm confident God will provide the answer. May God's peace be with you.